today's webinar evaluation crash course for non-evaluators. We will be beginning here today at the top of the hour. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the Evaluation Resource Hub for the Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate advanced ed evaluation in the AT community by offering trainings, cultivating a community, researching emerging topics, and collecting data about the ATE program. Be sure to check out the Evaluate website to learn more. The slides from this webinar are already on Evaluate's website and in our handout section of today's webinar, along with several other resources. You may also download these resources by following the link on the right side of your screen again in the handout tab. The recording will be available within a couple days of the webinar and that will be emailed to you. I'm Emma Lieberg and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Lisa wilson betchel will be the main presenter for this webinar. We both work with Evaluate, which is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. We'd like to also recognize our colleagues who have worked behind the scenes to help bring this webinar today, and also recognize Elaine Craft and Emery DeWitt from Mentor Connect for providing great insights and support, and also Evaluate's editor, Carol, Carolyn williams Norin. This webinar is designed for individuals funded by the NSF's Advanced Technological Education Program, or ATE for short. The ATE program is focused on improving techni technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. It funds projects in high-tech areas like advanced manufacturing, engineering technologies, IT, nanotechnologies, and so on. This is a good time to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Lissa to get us started. Thanks, Emma. So I'm Lissa, and I'm really excited to have you all here today to talk about evaluation. So we're gonna pack a lot into the next hour. So make sure that you stay tuned in and ready to jump in because we have a lot of interactivity as well as question breaks built in throughout the webinar. So if a question pops into your mind, just put it in the chat box and we'll be sure to address it in one of our three question breaks. And on that note, I wanna start off by knowing a little bit more about where you all are coming from. So you can answer polls like this on the right hand side of your screen underneath the polls tab. It should automatically pop up when Emma activates this poll, but if you don't see it, you can actually navigate to the poll tab next to the chat box tab. So in this poll, it asks which statement best describes you. Do you already have an ATE grant? Are you planning on submitting one for the first time? Or maybe you're funded through a different NSF program, or maybe you're planning to submit to a different NSF program, or maybe you're not involved with NSF whatsoever. So I see about half of our audience today has already submitted some answers, and I believe you can see the responses as well. So it looks like we have about half, uh, around 60 people here today that are not involved with NSF. So I hope you know, welcome, we're so glad you're here. So like Emma said, this webinar will be geared towards the NSF ATE program, but there's a lot of content that you can apply in other contexts as well. And then after that, it looks like about 30 people are here who are just planning to submit an ATE grant for your first time. Welcome, we're so glad to have you here and we're so glad to welcome you into the ATE community. And then another 20 of you or so already have an ATE grant. Wonderful. So this webinar is mainly for people who are trying to wrap their heads around the program evaluation for the first time but not necessarily. So this next poll, how would you describe your familiarity with evaluation? Do you have no idea what it is or where you should start? Maybe you've heard of it before, but you just need some pointers, or perhaps you're really familiar with evaluation. And you're just joining us to strengthen your understanding of the basics. Great, wow, well, it looks like a lot of you actually have a really good familiarity with evaluation. You're just here to strengthen your basics. But I see a few of you are brand new, have no idea where to start or what we're even talking about. Well, no matter where you are right now in your familiarity joining us today, I hope that you strengthen your understanding of the evaluation basics from this webinar. So to start off, I'd like to introduce you to Jen Generickson. So she's gonna help us today to work through the basics of evaluation so that you can all leave this webinar feeling confident about building evaluation into your project. 
So Jen, she has a great idea for an ATE project. Jen's college has noticed a drop in students' attendance and engagement in their technical programs. And this has dramatically increased over the past year with virtual learning due to COVID. So they are going to implement intrusive advising to reach students and then train advisors on how to use this approach to make sure that no students are falling through the cracks of academia. The college is also seeing a lot of dropouts among first-generation students. So they'll use grant funds to develop resource materials and strategies to support these students and to help them succeed regardless of the types of barriers they face in completing their education. And then finally, they're going to create a new virtual tech prep course, which will help students in technical programs develop their areas of critical thinking, teamwork skills, and resilience. So, uh, so they expect these activities to lead to an increase in the number of students completing technical degrees at their college and then transferring to four-year STEM programs. So Jen and her team feel like they have a pretty good plan that meets a real need at their college. She's reading over the ATE program solicitation before she starts writing her proposal. And she comes to the section on evaluation. So this section states that all projects, all projects carry uh, about evaluation activities. So she's never had an NSF grant before and she's not entirely sure what they mean by evaluation activities. In fact, she has a lot of questions like what even is evaluation? This project doesn't have a big budget, so how much is this evaluation going to cost? Why do we have to do evaluation anyways? Who does evaluation? Where does it go in the grant proposal itself? And then once you're funded, what will happen? How will this evaluation affect her project? Now, you might have these questions too. So in this webinar, we're going to walk through each one of these questions and help Jen wrap her head around evaluation. So let's start with the most fundamental question of what evaluation is. So if we look up the word in the dictionary, we'll find a definition like this. Evaluation is the determination of value, nature, character, or quality of something or someone. Well, okay, but that doesn't tell us a whole lot about what the funders mean by program evaluation. So there's an old story about a group of blindfolded people around an elephant. They can't see the whole elephant. They can only feel parts of it. Each person is pretty certain that they know what it is based on the part that they're experiencing. Well, I found that evaluation can be a lot like that. When I tell people that I work at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University, they'll often say, oh, uh, you do course evaluations, or you do surveys, or is that like auditing? And while each of these may be related to the evaluation process, None of them really give you the whole picture of evaluation. So boiled down to its main parts, evaluation involves four main steps. First involves asking important questions about a project's processes, outcomes, or other dimensions. This is about making sure that the evaluation focuses on things that really matter. The next step is gathering evidence that will help you answer those questions. Then we have to make sure, we have to make sense of those data. So we interpret the results and answer the evaluation questions. Then the last step is to use the information for accountability, improvement, and planning. But that's not really the final step because the evaluation should really inform decisions about the next project. So you get this cyclical, cyclical nature. So let's take a little closer look at what each of these steps really involves. So important questions might ask about whether goals were achieved, but they could also focus on a project's implementation, measuring outcomes like changes in the target population, or even looking at the sustainability of a project. In the elephant cartoon from earlier, one person equated evaluation with research. And yes, evidence for evaluation is often gathered using research methods like focus groups, interviews, surveys, observations, and sometimes even experimental designs. In the ATE program, evaluations often utilize a college's institutional data. They may use results from course evaluations, and sometimes they include feedback from panels of experts or advisors. When it comes to interpreting or making meaning of the data that was collected, evaluations most, almost always look for project strengths and weaknesses. 
In assessing outcomes, we should determine the magnitude or extent of the outcomes and their practical significance for the people involved. This is often done by comparing to some sort of benchmark or standard. Evaluation results can be used to make improvements to a project as it's being implemented or to plan new projects. Results can be included to funders, and it helps when seeking new funding as evidence of your capabilities. Lessons learned from evaluations can also contribute to a discipline's larger knowledge base around the effectiveness of different types of interventions. All right, so I, I wanna pause here because I know that was a lot of information at once. So I wanna stop here and take a moment to check in with yourself. So in the chat window to your right, I want you to share one word that describes how you're feeling right now. So just one word. Intrigued, comfortable, lucky, <laughs> excited, hopeful, I love that. Tired, engaged, fine. I, it sounds like some people are having some audio issues. Understanding, informative. I see some frazzled. Um, I'm glad that some are calm and excited and informed. All right, unsure, yeah. So for those of you who are experiencing some concerns or confusions, uh, let's go back to Jen's project and we can see how she should think about these four evaluation steps that we just walked through. So now Jen has an introduction to these four major steps of evaluation. Ideally, she would have an evaluator on board before she submits her project to help her develop a detailed plan of all four of these steps. But the most important step for Jen and other non-evaluators on her project is to determine what questions are the most important to her project and her team. It's really best to start thinking of these evaluation questions early in the project planning stage. So to do this, she might wanna map out how the activities she and her team are planning and how those activities are going to bring about the change she wants to see for students at her college. A really great way to do this is to develop a logic model. The ATE program doesn't actually require logic models, but people find them really useful for thinking through what the project is going to do and also for communicating that plan to others. So I will say this webinar is not really about the details of building a logic model. So I'm gonna go ahead and create Jen's logic model for her, but we do have some resources to share with you later about how you can do this for your own project. But for now, as I build this logic model, I'd like you to start thinking about what questions you think that the evaluation might wanna ask about Jen's project. So first we're gonna go ahead and plug in those activities that we know are part of the project in the activities column. Then we're gonna put in the outcomes that the project is supposed to achieve. So which are the increase of numbers, increase in the number of graduates who either transfer to four year, to STEM programs at four year colleges, or students who enter the technical workforce. So now we need to connect the activities to these desired long-term outcomes. It's expected that these activities will lead to more students passing technical courses and staying enrolled at the college. If those short-term outcomes are achieved, the college will see more students persisting in their technical programs and graduating with marketable technical credentials, which they can either use to transfer to a four-year STEM program or just go ahead and enter the workforce. So now that you see this project mapped out, what questions do you think that Jen and her evaluation team should ask in their evaluation? So use the chat bar to the right of your screen to share your ideas. So what evaluation questions do you think that Jen and her evaluation team should ask in this evaluation? You know, it might be helpful to think about what Jen might want to know in order to maybe impress NSF or her college administrators. Do you think that they would wanna focus more on the implementation activities or more on the achievements and outcomes? So Pamela says that one evaluation question might be, what is the current pass rate for technical courses? Yeah, I think that might be a great thing to know now, but in the evaluation, you wanna know the change in pass rate, right? So that would be a great question. So to what extent did the pass rate change for technical courses? I see a number of people are asking about student success rates or maybe current graduation rates. 
So I do want to point out that if we're talking about long term outcomes, particularly maybe graduation rates, you know, to ask whether or not this pro program, this project affected graduation rates, maybe outside of the timeline for an evaluation, because ATE programs tend to be about three years long. So measuring a change in graduation rates might be a little bit difficult within that timeline. So I do see some, uh, some people asking about implementation questions. So those process questions. So how were these activities implemented? How successful was it? So I love that idea of asking a mix of both process questions and outcomes questions. Let's see, I'm reading all of your wonderful questions here. How many students persisted? Yeah, so I see a lot of you are getting at measuring change in those short and midterm outcomes. That's great. I also like that a lot of you have phrased your questions so that they're not just a, a simple yes or no question, right? But that the answer to those questions will lead to more understanding about the project and the context that led to its success or, or explain its non-success, certainly. And then another thing is with all of these questions, it might be really useful to consider upfront for Jen's team how they're really going to use these findings. Who are they going to report the findings to? How are they going to reflect on them as a team? And I think that in considering upfront in the planning phase, how you're going to use the findings to these evaluation questions can really help you determine whether or not that's the right evaluation question to be asking. Yeah, at what cost? Such a great, uh, yeah, and I see Amy said too, how much money was spent per student? So those cost analysis questions can be so important. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for your participation here. Let's go ahead and check back in with Jen. So now Jen has some really good ideas for what question her evaluation will address. She and her evaluator will need to consider how they'll gather the data to answer those questions. So we typically aim for a mix of quantitative and qualitative data from multiple sources to address our evaluation questions. Numbers and stories together really tend to tell a fuller picture of a project, as well as make a more convincing argument to stakeholders. So step number three, once Jen's evaluators have collected the data, they'll need a plan for interpreting that data. So the numbers and quotes alone are not always meaningful for the project or its context. This interpretation is an important step in the evaluation to ensure meaningful and useful findings. So once the data is interpreted, the evaluation findings can be integrated into a written and oral report that's shared back with Jen and her staff and maybe to her um, college administrators and back to NSF as well. So here is where Jen and her team will need to consider how her project might need to react or change based on the evaluation findings or perhaps she's ready to think of her next project. So if you're interested in learning more about logic models, we have a couple of resources in our handout that you might wanna check out. So the first is a logic model template, and the second is a full webinar that demonstrates how to develop a logic model and how to really use it in your grant proposal. To learn more about the qualities of good evaluation questions, check out our evaluation question checklist. So links to all of these resource materials that I mentioned in the webinar are available in the handout that you can download to the right side of your screen. So now Jen has a better sense of what it means to have her project evaluated, but it's actually more involved than she imagined. So now she's concerned about how much it will cost. So we'll get to that in a bit, but we wanna pause here to address any questions that you might have. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Emma. Thanks, Lissa. So great first session there. We did get one question in from Amy, who is asking, I am interested in any guidance on the optimal number of questions to ask in an evaluation. So could you help Amy out with that? Such a great question, Amy. And I think this is a great uh, point to talk about the difference between evaluation questions and something like survey questions. So if you're going to write a survey, you might have a survey of 10, 15, 20 questions. But when we're talking about evaluation questions, we really want those to be broad in scope. And so I would really suggest remaining around five evaluation questions, particularly for an ATE project. 
you know, maybe if your project and your timeline is a little bit longer, they might be able to, they, they might want to expand to something like 10 or 12 questions. But I think remembering that you're, you're only looking, your evaluation questions should be a way to scope your evaluation and place boundaries around it. Basically, you're aiming your magnifying glass in a certain direction. So I've seen some evaluations that have successfully done a lot more evaluation questions, um, but sometimes those questions get really detailed, um, too detailed a little bit, and don't really allow you to expand and, and answer those questions in a useful way. Question that came in from Celia asking, should we use external or internal evaluators? Another great question. So this is a little bit of a spoiler to some of our upcoming content, but uh, the ATE program in NSF does actually require you to have an external evaluator. However, I would suggest that there be a partnership between some internal evaluation activity and your external evaluation team as well. And so again, it really depends on the scope of the project that you're evaluating, the resources that you have, and of course, the restrictions and requirements from your funder. And we've got one more question in from Andrea. She says, with my team, we are constantly trying to understand what NSF wants in the evaluation. That is, do we frame the evaluation on the needs of the project or perceived needs of NSF? It seems possible that the two are not always the same, e.g. formative slash summative evaluations. Yes, thanks for that question, Andrea. And I'm not sure if you are in the ATE program in particular. And if you are outside of the ATE program, I want to make sure that you are reading your specific program solicitation to look at what NSF is, is wanting, as well as talk with your program officer about that. And I think that's a great idea for ATE folks as well. But I know that in the ATE program, it is kind of purposely open-ended because NSF really wants your evaluation to work for your project. And so it really should fulfill the requirement that NSF has you conduct evaluation, but also improve your offerings for your project. So improve your activities, understand what's working, what's not working, and help you really make those pivots where you need to. Great. We have another question from Amber. What are the pros of using an external evaluator? Yes, I think there could be a lot of pros for sure. I think the most uh, commonly cited pro is this idea of, um, I was trying to avoid the word objectivity, but I, I'm going to say it anyways. And so this idea that it's someone outside of the team, someone to bring in a different perspective, um, someone who can really look at what's working and what's not working from a more objective standpoint. Um, I think that could be a potential pro, but I also think that having a more involved uh, evaluator is could also be really helpful for your program. Um, and the other, the other pro that I would want to point out is whether or not the person that you're bringing on to conduct that evaluation really has evaluation expertise, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. One more question for this round. So Alaric is asking, does an external evaluator require a specific set of qualifications related to the program being developed? So I don't think that there is a specific set of qualifications. Again, we talk about this a little bit later, but there is no specific degree or credential or certification for program evaluators. So instead, it's kind of a suggested list of things that you should look for that will really work for your program. And the first thing that I would point out is making sure that you find an evaluator who has prior experience in evaluation that not only do they have those strong research skills, but they also have strong evaluation skills. So that's knowledge of evaluation approaches, evaluation theory, um, because it really is unique methodology and unique theory around evaluation compared to other social science. Um, so hopefully we'll get a little bit into that um, some more in our next section. 
Well, thank you so much for answering those, Lissa. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and move along to the next session. Uh, go ahead and keep putting your questions in the chat box for Lissa. So, Lissa, back to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you for all of those great questions. And so I also noticed that no one asked how much does it cost? You must have known that that was our upcoming question. So let's get to that burning question of how much does an evaluation cost? So here's an excerpt from the ATE program solicitation about the evaluation requirement. It does state that the evaluation budget must match the scope of the proposed evaluative activities. And that's certainly important, but it's not really satisfying for people who just want to figure out, get a figure into their budget that they can really work with. So the general rule of thumb is that 10% of your project's uh, direct cost should be allocated for evaluation. And that's evaluation in any context. It's a good place to start, but then you can go up or down from there, depending on what level of evaluation is needed for your project. So a variety of factors can influence a project's evaluation budget. So some examples of these factors include maybe the type of question that your evaluation is asking. So evaluation questions that focus on process implementation, they may be less costly than questions that ask about long-term outcomes due to the time and data needed to really get at those long-term outcome questions. The type of data that you're using can also affect the budget. Existing data may be less time consuming for the evaluation team compared to what they would need to gather new data, which might be more costly. Whether that data is quantitative or qualitative, so qualitative data tends to be more time intensive when it comes to data collection, data cleaning, and analysis. And therefore, evaluations that heavily rely on qualitative data may be more expensive. Different evaluators interact with a project differently. So if you're looking for an evaluator who will be highly responsive to changes in project activities, timelines, or data needs, they might be more costly than a more rigid, less responsive evaluation. Similarly, an evaluator who is more involved with meetings or decision-making may be more costly due to the increased time. Evaluation efforts can be shared between external and evaluators and internal evaluation efforts. We talked a little bit about this earlier. But more assistance from internal evaluation may also reduce the burden on your external evaluators, which would then make the evaluation less costly. Something else to consider is travel time. So I know that this looks a little bit different during COVID times, but you might want to consider how far away your evaluator is and how long they'll have to travel in order for meetings or for site visits. So longer travel times will lead to a higher evaluation budget. So I wanted to share these not as a formula to write an evaluation budget, but as some guideposts to understand how that 10% rule might be affected by the type of evaluation your project is looking for. So it's always best to have an open and honest conversation with your evaluator about your needs and about their needs. So the fact of the matter is, if evaluation is going to bring value to your project, you have to fund it adequately. So Frankly, Jen would rather use those funds for services that will have a direct impact on students. So she's wondering why she should spend money on an evaluation. Well, a quick answer is that she has to because it's required by NSF. It's a matter of compliance. And while that may be reason enough, I really think it'll help to step back and consider why NSF requires evaluation. So there are a lot of good reasons to have your project evaluated, even if it's not required. So in general, evaluation serves three main purposes for improvement, accountability, and evidence. So we'll walk through each of these, starting with improvement, because really it's the most important in my book. Some like to say that the most important purpose of evaluation is not to prove, but to improve. So here's the logic model for Jen's project. This is how she and her team expect the project to work. But the evaluation results may show that it doesn't actually work this way, for better or for worse. Evaluation can provide insights on how to adjust the project's activities to really maximize the outcomes. So I want to share an example from a project that was funded through NSF's new to ATE program. The project was called Rebranding the 21st Century IT Technician, and the principal investigator was Asa Bradley at Spokane Community, Univers Community College. 
She wrote a blog about her experience, and you can find the link to that blog on the webinar handout. Her grant was aimed at increasing female enrollment and retention in her college's information systems program. The project included a day-long IT camp for incoming 8th and 9th grade young women. So in the original project plan, she had set aside money for five college students to help for eight hours during the summer camp. So they ended up having more college students want to be involved than she expected. And those students brought more ideas and leadership to the project than was anticipated. The project's evaluation included a survey of these college students at the end. And that survey showed that nearly all of them believed that the camp experience really increased their confidence as leaders and their ability to work in teams. So as Asa wrote in her blog, we were happy that we decided to work with an external evaluator, even though our grant is small grant for institutions new to ATE. Because of the questions our evaluator asked, we had the data to justify moving resources around in our budget. So that's just one example of how a project really used its evaluation results for improvement and to change project activities. Now let's consider accountability. So at the most basic level, evaluation enables a high degree of accountability. Individual grants are held accountable for their use of federal resources, and the information helps NSF be accountable to Congress and to justified continued support for the program. Projects funded by NSF have to submit reports annually through an online system called research.gov. The main report sections are shown here. So in the accomplishment section, Grantees report on their project goals, activities, objectives, results, and their outcomes. Evidence of project results and outcomes are going to come in large part from the evaluation. This section is also where grantees upload their evaluation reports so their NSF program officers can review it. If a project encounters problems or opportunities to shift a project's focus a bit, a bit to maximize outcomes, just like Asa did, evidence to sustain substantiate a change in plans can be included in this section for changes or problems. In addition to providing evaluation results annually to NSF as an accountability function, NSF grantees also need evidence of project outcomes if they apply for another grant from NSF in the future. So if Jen goes back to NSF in a few years to request funding for a new project, she'll have to begin her proposal with a section called results from prior NSF support. And this subsection has to include evidence of specific outcomes and results, including metrics to demonstrate the impact of the project's activities. So here are three sets of statements that could show up in a results of prior support section in a future proposal that Jen submits. Take your time to read these examples carefully and then answer the poll to indicate which examples would be most compelling to reviewers as evidence of the outcomes. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and stay quiet for about 90 seconds to allow you time to read and respond to the poll. Right, so it's been almost 90 seconds. I see that we have about 60% of people who have voiced which uh, example of evidence would be most convincing to them as reviewers. 
So let's go ahead and look at each of these examples more closely. So example A only said what they were funded to do. So the ATE program lead, Celeste Carter, says that this is all too often and all too common in ATE proposals. People just cut and paste from their prior proposal. So definitely I would, I would suggest not to do that. In example B, only reported on activities. So it included a lot of numbers like 150 students enrolled or 300 students benefited or 25 faculty members participated. But these are just counts of what happened. There isn't actually evidence of what happened to the students as a result of these activities. So example C answered the questions of so what? So what happened to those students after they participated? They their uh, pass rates increased, they overcame challenges. This example includes evidence of what changes were brought about because of the project. So this is what you really want to aim for. So if you want to know more about what goes into the results from prior support section, see our checklist on this topic. It includes the NSF requirements plus evaluate suggestions for getting the most out of the section of our proposal. And even if you're just thinking about submitting your first NSF proposal, it's not too early to think about how you want to be able to talk about your accomplishments with this project in the future. It can really help your evaluation planning. So Jen is getting the idea about why evaluation is important, but she's not sure who is supposed to do this work. So we'll address that question next after our second question break. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Emma. Everyone who uh, went ahead and submitted questions during that last round. Um, we did get a question by Candy, um, but I am actually going to hold that one off until the next round because it is regarding uh, kind of the clarification on what an outside evaluator means outside of your college or outside of your team. So I think we're going to get to that in the next section, Candy. So I'm going to hold off on that one. Um, so let's go ahead and launch this one. This is by uh, Bartholomew, and I think also Patrick had the same question. Um, are there evaluator training programs available for those here who might want to volunteer or practice how to do evaluations? Great question, Bartholomew. I think that there are a lot of training programs and opportunities available. I guess it just depends on to what extent you are looking to learn about evaluation. There's everything from PhD programs in evaluation, master's programs in evaluation, um, and then there's a lot of opportunities for certificates or uh, professional development trainings. Um, everything from opportunities through Evaluate to the American Evaluation Association. I believe their website is eval.org, and they have a lot of great things that go through their organization, but also that they promote from other organizations that provide training. Perfect, thank you. Um, that was the other only question that came in for this break. Um, just to confirm, Lisa, we are talking about uh, in the next section about evaluators and kind of how to find them, correct? We are. So yeah. we'll hold that one. And then if there are still questions after that, we have one more question break until the end of our webinar. Perfect. So I'll hand it back to you. Uh, we'll go ahead into the next section. All right. Speaking of that, so who can do evaluations anyways? So Jen has a lot of really smart people on her team. So she's wondering if they can just do the evaluation internally. So the answer to that question is no, because the ATE program does specifically state that the evaluator must be independent of the project. So this is what we were just talking about. So the evaluator can work, can work in the same institution where the project is located. However, the evaluator must work in a separate unit with a separate reporting chain. So your evaluator cannot report to or be the report of the, the PI or any of the project staff. So when it comes down to it, it really is just better if the evaluator can work on a, it, it, from a different institution so that it's clear that they're truly external and independent. So believe it or not, evaluation really is a unique profession and a discipline. 
We actually have professional associations, like I just mentioned, the American Evaluation Association. There's also a Canadian Evaluation Association, an Australasia Evaluation Association, European Evaluation Association. We have our own scholarship and academic journals, and a whole lot of professionals who identify as evaluators. So when looking for an evaluator, it's really important to know that there are no specific degrees or certifications that are required to call oneself an evaluator. We talked about this a little bit earlier. I mean, pretty much anyone can put out a sign and say that they're an evaluator. We also see that some big consulting firms say that evaluation is one type of the services that they offer. So neither of these things really ensures that they are qualified as an evaluator but it also doesn't mean that they're not qualified as an evaluator. So you really wanna be careful to look for someone who has experience as an evaluator, that they have managed, designed, and carried out evaluations prior. Someone who has strong research skills, someone that's a good communicator and will be responsive to your situation. It can also be helpful for someone to have an understanding of NSF or two-year context, or an understanding of your specific context if you're outside the ATE program. So it's not always easy to find someone this, with this perfect mix of credentials. So let's help Jen select an evaluator for her project. So take a moment to review the credentials of these three evaluators and use the poll to make your recommendation about which one Jen should approach for her project. If you have any reservations about your suggestion, use the chat to explain any of your concerns. So it looks like at least half of you have suggested an evaluator for Jen. So let's take a look at each of these evaluators. So sometimes it can be difficult to tell whether they're a good fit from their resume alone, and some follow-up questions might be needed to get more information. So evaluator A seems to have some really good knowledge of two-year colleges, technical education, and student services but I'd want to know more about their experience as an external evaluator of grant-funded projects. Accreditation has a lot in common with project evaluation, but it's not necessarily the same thing. Evaluator B looks like they have great credentials when it comes to evaluation. I would definitely wanna know how much time they would really have to work on the project, given that they're working with 25 other evaluations. And I would suspect that they would have a team working with them. So I'd want to know who would actually be working on our project and what their credentials are. An evaluator C certainly knows two-year colleges and NSF, but it's not clear if they have any ex expertise when it comes to research methods or running evaluations. So I would ask about those things. So for my, more guidance on how to select an evaluator, see our guide to finding and selecting an evaluator for ATE proposals. The link again is on the webinar handout. And keep in mind that you must have an independent evaluator, but that doesn't mean that you can't do some of the evaluation work internally. So while the evaluator should be responsible for the more technical aspects of evaluation, things related to data collection, data analysis, and reporting, the project team is really in the best position to keep track of who is involved in what the project is doing. The project team and the evaluator can work together to plan the evaluation, collect the data, and interpret the results. And this isn't just about cost cutting. It's about making sure that evaluation is really feasible and relevant to the key stakeholders. Some of the most productive evaluations have a collaborative relationship between the project team and the external evaluation team. So our friend Jen is warming up to the idea of having her project evaluated but she's not clear on how it's supposed to show up in her proposal. She knows to check NSF's Proposals and Award Policies and Procedure Guide, the PAPPG, as it's typically known, 
but it doesn't provide any guidance for how to adjust, address the project's external evaluation. As you work on your proposals, I would really encourage you to think of them as a jigsaw puzzle. Each piece of your proposal needs to fit with the other pieces to convey an overall coherent picture of what you will do with the grant funds, why it's important, and when it will happen. So these are the required elements of an NSF proposal. The check marks identify the parts that the parts where uh, there should be in information related to the evaluation. So we're not getting into the details of all of these sections today. Rather, we're going to hone in on the project description. The project description is the main part of the NSF proposal, and it can be up to 15 pages long. The content that I have listed here are based on guidance from the ATE program solicitation. The section of the project's description where you will definitely need information about your evaluation are from the results from prior support section, if you've been funded before, and as we've discussed, as we've already discussed, and of course, in the evaluation plan section. Of the 15 page project description, one to three should be dedicated to the evaluation. I would actually aim for around a page and a half unless you have really good reasons for it to be shorter or longer than that. In this small space, you should identify your evaluator, what the evaluation questions will be, what data will be collected and how it will be used to answer the evaluation questions, what types of evaluation reports or other deliverables will be prepared and when. So we have a video series and actually a webinar that goes into more depth on all of this. So when you're ready to write your evaluation plan section, I hope you come back and watch those resources. In the meantime, there's a lot of information about how to build evaluation into your proposal in our comprehensive ATE evaluation planning checklist. And for specific guidance on how to organize the evaluation section, see our evaluation plan template. So hopefully we've uh, taken some of the mystery out of evaluation, but this has all been what happens before a project gets funded. So you may still be wondering what happens after you get your grant. So let's take a few minutes just to touch on that. Generally speaking, each year of the grant, the evaluation will go through a cycle of data collection, analysis, reporting, and also using the evaluation to make adjustments as needed for the next year's work. In year one, more time will be dedicated to planning the evaluation. And it's a good idea to meet with your evaluator in person or via video conference during this phase if possible. This will involve establishing a formal agreement between the evaluator and the project's institution. Then the evaluator will work with you to develop an actionable evaluation plan because that page and a half that we discussed before from the proposal, it just doesn't have enough details to really set things in motion. This is also a time to establish a relationship with the college's institutional research office to find out what data they'll be able to provide, how to best work with them, and even starting to obtain baseline data. Most most likely, some data collection instruments or protocol will need to be developed and tested, and that will happen during this planning phase as well. So after that, primary data collection can finally begin. The first evaluation report will need to be delivered in advance of the project's first annual report to NSF. So that happens pretty quickly. Then the data analysis, data collection, analysis, and reporting cycle can repeat itself annually with periodic meetings and ongoing communication with the evaluator. So to make sure that you get a good plan in place for working with your evaluator, use our communication plan checklist for ATPIs and evaluators. When, evaluator, when evaluations go wrong, it's most often due to poor communication or even miscommunication between the evaluator and the project team. So this checklist will help you make sure you're off to a good start. Okay, so Jen is feeling pretty good about having her project evaluated now. I hope you are too. So we have our last question break. So if you have any lingering questions or elements that you'd like further details on, or you want further discussion on, go ahead and put those in the chat now. Please also stick around for some additional uh, information on evaluate events, as well as our post webinar evaluation survey. It's really important to us. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Emma. 
Thanks, Lissa. So I am going to go ahead and circle back around just to make sure uh, Candy feels like she got her question answered there um, in the last round. Um, so just to clarify for her and anyone else that might have this question, uh, when we say outside in terms of an external evaluator, um, is that meaning outside of our college or just our team? So just maybe elaborating a little bit more. I know we already covered it a little bit. Yeah, we actually have a really great visual that actually comes from our proposal webinar that talks about the, the specific details of what does external to your team mean. Um, it, it really does mean external to your project team. It can be someone within your college. However, you have to be very careful that they are not on the project in any way. So they have no budget line. They're not being paid out of the college that they are. There's no power play involved, right? So they are not the supervisor of someone on the project or someone on the project is not their supervisor. Um, just to make sure that you're getting that third party perspective that there is no um, conflict of interest between that external evaluator and the project team. So I think Emma just found that document that I was talking about. Thank you so much, Emma, and through the link in the chat. So go check that out and let us know if you have additional questions. Great, thanks, Lisa. All right, the next one is from Juliana. She said, how can one know if it is better to build capacity in evaluation in the organization or department or to hire a specialized experienced professional? I think that question could probably be um, better answered in a one on one if with I, if I had more contextual information. However, I guess my question back would be, how are you going to build that capacity? You probably need someone to help you walk down that road, right? So at some point you are going to hire and interact with an experienced um, evaluation professional. And so I, I really think that getting someone on board who can make a uh, a plan for strengthening your evaluation capacity internally will help you decide what is the best balance for you because I think there's a lot of uh, details that would go into answering that for your specific project. That's a great suggestion, Lissa. Um, we've got another uh, kind of comment, but I think it's an opportunity to maybe make a uh, remark about IRBs. So Robin points out that she finds that IRBs often want, uh, NSF often wants IRBs in place to ensure data will be collected before words are made, which tends to hurry the evaluation planning to meet IRB submissions. So I think this is just a good uh, spot to kind of note IRBs and kind of what those are for those who don't know um, and maybe reflect on this a tiny bit. Yeah, I think that's a really great point, Robin. I think there are a lot of um, systemic factors that come into play, both from the college side, the evaluator side, as well as NSF, that, that tend to influence how we make those evaluation plans and what those timelines look like. For those who are not familiar with an IRB, it's an institutional review board. And so basically the institutional review board will look over your evaluation plan to ensure that um, data is being kept safe, that there's no harm to participants, that basically we're being ethical with our evaluation practice. And so I, there are so many different suggestions and guidelines and honestly, every institution's IRB acts fairly differently. And so I would say if you have specific questions about IRB, that's a topic that's that's pretty well discussed in our um, Evaluate Slack network. And so if you have specific questions on there, I would really encourage you to join our Slack network and go read the conversations there, but then also ask your question. Thank you, really great response. Uh, one last question from Jan Lee it came in. Uh, what is considered a reasonable time frame for planning on that first year for evaluation? That's a good question. You know, timelines really change for every project. I really tried to put details in this webinar that so I could avoid answering questions with, well, it really depends on your project, but somehow I'm still saying that answer. You know, so I think you have to look at when the contracts are set in place, when the primary activities will be uh, carried out, and then when you're looking to get a report. 
And so I think all of those milestones will really come into play about planning periods. Um, but I, I definitely encourage contacting your evaluation team early on, being in constant conversation with them. So as soon as you hear that you've been funded, making sure that if you have an evaluator on board already that you're reaching out to them to say that you've been funded and maybe even putting a, a meeting on the calendar for you to talk about how you can really flesh out that page and a half evaluation plan that was in your proposal. Awesome. Well, that wraps up our questions that came in. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, move us forward here to go ahead and finish up these slides. So please stay with us. We got a few great announcements here. So if we didn't get to your question or what you want to continue the conversation, uh, please join us for our upcoming web chat on March 23rd, where we will be having Lissa back. We'll also have Elaine Craft from Mentor Connect joining us to help answer additional questions on this subject. Um, and again, our web chats are small group discussions around various topics. And uh, if you would like, you can go ahead and jump on our website. Anna just put in the link there to go ahead and register for that web chat. We also have web chats scheduled for every month this year. So please make sure to join us for those. Additionally, if you have uh, questions that maybe need to be uh, kind of that one-on-one -on -one opportunity, uh, take advantage of our ATE evaluation coaching. Um, this is a free program that is available to ATE applicants, project staff, grant specialists, and evaluators. Um, and our coaches can work with you to develop an evaluation plan, review evaluation instruments, or discuss evaluation reporting. So they're not just here for the beginning or that application pays, they're here for the entire life of your ATE project. So do make sure to take advantage of that program. Again, it is free to uh, our ATE program uh, participants. And you can schedule that appointment right on our website and Anna has dropped the link in the chat box for you as well on that. And then if you have additional questions, as Lissa just called it out, um, we do hope that you will join us on the Evaluate Slack community. The Slack community is a great place to meet new evaluation community members. Um, so we encourage you to go out to our website and join that. Um, if you already are a member, please come and chat with us, help answer other people's questions in the community and get to know others. Again, as Lissa mentioned, we have a great conversation in there regarding uh, HSI, uh, IRB requirements. Um, so you might actually get your question answered simply by coming over to our community. So with that, um, we will go ahead and launch our post-webinar survey, as Lissa mentioned. Um, we do hope all of you take this for us. I'm launching it right now. You should go ahead and see that at the bottom of your screen. This feedback really helps evaluate, continue to improve our webinar series and provide the best uh, resources for you. So again, please take a few moments to complete that post-webinar survey. Uh, that does conclude today's webinar. So thank you so much to Lissa and Anna for doing our tech support and all of you for coming and answer, asking such great questions. Uh, we will be online for the next few minutes. So if you do have additional questions, you can post them um, and we can get back to you uh, via email for those. So with that, thank you all for attending today's webinar. Uh, and please reach out to us and join the networks if you have additional questions. Thank you.